Uh, today's Bible reading, if I can pull it up, there we go, contains three passages. Uh, firstly, Psalms 103, 13 to 14, Hebrews 12, 17, uh, sorry, 7 to 11, and Jonah chapters 3 and 4. Psalm 103, 13 to 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Hebrews 12, 7 to 11. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And Jonah, chapters 3 and 4. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. But to Jonah... This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head. So that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? 
It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said to him, you have been concerned about the plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the left, and also many animals? Thanks so much, Ed, for reading that out. And um, yeah, we're going to go through those those passages, and um, yeah, it may seem a little bit random um, passages for Father's Day, but <laughs> sort of see how we go. And I don't know, you might have been even laughing a little bit. We'll get to Jonah a little bit later, but it's okay to laugh. It's actually quite a funny story, but also what we'll see is very confronting as well. Um, but yeah, we're in a we're in a bit of a series um, uh, called Our Father that. I started last week and, and sort of thought we'd just take a bit of a break from the book of Acts and, um, and yeah, just with Father's Day today kind of in the middle, I uh, just thought that it would work out really well to just take some time, um, yeah, to, to reflect on God as our, our Father. And uh, I shared sort of last um, week uh, the sort of backstory to sort of these topics that, that I wanted, felt to share was... Uh, a few years ago when I was just in, a, in quite a difficult season and was facing some challenges and seeking God in prayer and um, just felt him say something really simple, but, but that really changed my perspective and, and yeah, just revealed something about him and, and the things that he said uh, into the challenge that I was facing was simply that he said, I know, I care, and I'm working. And uh, it, it, this went deep into my heart um, and gave me uh, a, a sense of trust in, and peace. And, and in that moment, nothing changed, but, but there was a great comfort that came from the fact that no, God, God knows the situation. I can talk to him about it. He cares probably more than me, and he's at work. And I couldn't necessarily see that, but to trust that actually just changed the way that um, I thought about everything. And last week was um, yeah, just taking some time to, to think about the, the truth that God knows us, and there's so much in Scripture uh, that, that teaches that, and looked at how God knows us more than anybody else. He knows us intimately and, and in great detail. Uh, he knows our needs before we ask, but and He also knows what He's doing in the world, even when it looks like it doesn't make any sense to us. He, he has infinite knowledge, and He understands all the complexity, and, and He knows what He's doing, and, and the invitation is to trust Him in the midst of that, especially when things are challenging and hard. And I kind of touched on it a little bit last week, but going to go a bit deeper into it this week. That it's not that he just knows us and knows the challenges and knows the issues, knows the past, uh, but it's also that he cares. He cares for us deeply. He cares for us in the challenges. And what we'll see today, particularly if we look at, at the, the story of Jonah, is that he perhaps even cares in, in ways more than we could even imagine that actually confront us in our lack of care as well. So let's um, pray, and then, yeah, we'll go through those passages and a few others. We'll, we'll take some time uh, to pray and reflect as we go through, and just be open to God speaking to us by His Spirit as, as we do that. So, Father, thank you, um, yeah, for this day that we honor fathers, and, um, yeah, we thank you for the, the gift that we can call you our Father because of Jesus, and, um, yeah, we thank you for the Spirit that, that, that yeah, encourages us and calls us to, to cry out to you as our, our Father, and, um, yeah, our King, and we just ask that by your Spirit, you speak to us your word today um, into our hearts, yeah, reveal your nature and your character, and into our situations that are challenging and difficult, and yeah, in, in the room this large, there's so much that's going on in so many different people's lives, and it's amazing that you, you know it and you understand it, and we just ask that you speak into it, um, yeah, and meet us um, today, we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. So, um, yeah, God knows us, and He cares, and His heart of care is, is reflected in Scripture as the heart of care of, of a father, uh, and the, 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 with the same kind of compassion that a parent has for their child. The, the verse we read out is well known from Psalm 103 that is read before, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. 
For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Again, the idea here, God knows us. He knows our weaknesses. He created us. He has the heart of a father to us. And, and his, his heart, when he sees us in our weakness and our frailty, is not to be distant from us or to, to reject us. It's actually to move toward us. It's to, he, he understands. He knows it all. But his heart is of compassion and care. When God revealed himself to Moses, this was one of the key character traits he revealed. And then this um, description of God is repeated again and again and again throughout Scripture. One time is in Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. He, he cares for his creation. He cares uh, for his people. He cares for the whole world. And in light of that, again and again, his desire and the encouragement of the biblical authors and the writers are, is that we're to come to him with our cares, with our challenges. He desires that we bring them to him because he's the one that cares and he's the one that can ultimately support us. Um, one of the well-known encouragements is from 1 Peter 5 verse 7. He says this, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Is the, the encouragement is God cares so we can give him our cares. He cares for us as our father so we can give our challenging situations and our cares to him. Again, he, he knows them better than anybody. He's aware of them and he cares for us and he cares for whatever is going on and often cares way more than we do and with way more attention to detail than we do. When Jesus is encouraging people to not be worried about their, their life, he highlights just how much attention to detail God the Father cares for his creation, that he cares for us, but he cares for the birds who are being fed, and he cares for the flowers, even though they might only exist for a day or a week or a season. God, like God, Jesus' picture of the world is that God the Father is tending and caring for the creation with that level of detail, and knows us with such great detail that he knows the hairs in our head. It's, like, it's not like we can only bring the really big, important things to God that we've tried everything else, and I suppose we should bother God. Like, it's like, no, like God is already caring with abundant detail to everything. He's sustaining everything, and we can bring it all to him. And he's not annoyed at that. If anything, he's annoyed when we don't, because uh, his heart is for us. And when we come to him, it, it's actually a heart that's moved toward us. Uh, John Mark Comer on this says this, when we come before God in morning prayer or in worship at church or in our afternoon run or in the middle of a crisis at work, we come before a God who feels, who cares about us and a God who acts, who wants to help to do something about our situation. That is, God's com compassionate. He actually feels and connects with us and cares for us. And He's gracious. He wants to help and, and, and work. And again, we're going to highlight that more uh, next week as well. So when we face uh, challenges, there can be great comfort that comes from the fact that God knows that God cares. We can actually bring and give that care and anxiety to Him. And, and often there's kind of like the objective facts about whatever the challenge or situation or crisis is. And then on top of that, there's the stress and there's the anxiety and there's our emotional response to the challenge. And, and that can sometimes be worse than the challenge itself. But the invitation is particularly to bring, well, to bring both, but to particularly bring our anxious cares and our worries to surrender them to God by giving the actual situation to Him and trusting that He knows it he cares about it. He's working with it. And if, if we can actually do that, that can shift the way that we actually even interact and, and approach whatever challenge that might be. He's, he's compassionate and merciful and cares for us in our challenges. So let, let, let's just pause there and just on that point, um, take a moment to, to pray and just thank God for his great compassion and how he, he literally cares about you whatever challenges and difficulties you're facing, however big, however small. And uh, you may have already, but you could, again, just take a moment to give those to him in prayer. Again, the, the Peter passage is the idea of casting them before God. It's a surrender. It's a handing over, letting him carry the burden. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to pray and, and reflect now.
Right, yeah. So as, as we looked at last week, God knows our need beforehand. So often he meets them without even us asking. And then there's times when we ask and he provides and answers and, and gives and, and, and um, yeah, changes and shifts things. Um, but there's, there's also times when uh, we may do that, give the challenge, the difficulty, whatever it is that we're facing to him, and that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to take it away. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean he's just going to make everything comfortable and easy. Uh, and particularly because that actually might not be the caring thing to do. Uh, he, he's a father, and a good father actually helps their children to grow. Uh, and a lot of growth comes through actually facing difficulties, enduring hardship and challenges and support. And that's like actually a key role of a father, uh, the role is not to just rescue from any pain or hardship. And this, is, this encouragement comes up, as we heard before, in Hebrews 12, a church that is struggling, and the, the author speaks and encourages them to think about what they're I- facing as a form of God's discipline, but then if, when you think about it as a form of God's discipline, it's actually a form of His love. It actually totally reframes the challenge they're facing. Um, it says this, in Hebrews 12, starting from verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? This is from, this is from Proverbs. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. He goes on and talks about, again, the natural experience of that. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It's so interesting. And um, there's, there's, uh, talking about discipline can be a massive topic that brings up whole lots of things uh, and it's massively complex and there's definitely an abundance of ways that people, fathers can discipline children that are not good and not helpful and incredibly damaging and painful, and there, there, there may be experiences of that. But at the same time, there can be an overreaction to that, to not discipline, to not correct, to not challenge, to not let experience hardship, and to always want to protect and rescue and help. And that's actually also and not caring and not helpful as well. There's these sort of two extremes. And it's just interesting how the, the author here um, kind of is wrestling with the fact that, that God's discipline and God's discipline is perfect. The human father's discipline is, is imperfect. But even when he's reflecting on this, he's kind of reflecting on it with a gracious attitude, saying that actually like uh, where, where we've had parents who've disciplined us, there's been actually later on respect for that and gratitude for that. And like, not, maybe not everyone can say that. I can definitely say that. I'm really grateful my dad is here and my mom's out doing the kids. So I'm really grateful to them for their discipline and, and, and encouragement and, and times have let me go through challenge and, and pain and definitely glad they didn't just give me everything I asked for all the time. Like that would be terrible. Like, like at the moment, in the moment I was a kid, I was so upset about it. Like, but but um, like that, that's, that, that was actually an expression of care to allow and to, to show discipline. And the author here has a gracious attitude to their parents in saying that they disciplined us the way that they thought best. And th- that's probably true for most parents. Uh, even parents who did it really badly, it's probably that they were doing the best they could and they didn't, ha- they didn't have an example to follow at all, and, and maybe that's not always the case, but there's a, there's a, there's a graciousness here that, and, and for those of us who are parents, it's hard, and we're just trying to do the best that we could, and it's a hard balance to find. I find it really, really hard. And, um, but God is perfect, right? His discipline is 
is perfect. Like if he, if he has a, a plan and a strategy and something he's allowing us and working through, it's because he loves us and he, and he cares. And what we can actually do is, is let what we're experiencing be reframed as, as that. And that's not at all saying that God is causing all the challenges and, and hardships, but that there may be situations where he is working through it and enduring it is a way that's actually going to grow us. And he says here is actually going to produce a holiness in us, and um, it's it's painful though in the moment, right? And as a parent, it's painful for the parent, and perhaps for God when He's allowing us to endure hardship. Perhaps it's painful for Him, like, but He but He allows it. He He works through it. Uh, he loves us enough to not rescue us from every difficulty, but but actually allow things that actually will grow us in Him. He cares about our character and our growth. So we can trust him as he fathers us in the midst of the challenges we face. He doesn't just want to give us, he, he, he comforts us, definitely. But to, to comfort us in the way that we might want in terms of removing all pain or challenge or difficulty is actually not caring. Uh, the, caring the, the greater thing is actually the growth in our character. That's what he ultimately cares about. And I think when we understand that, we can even experience his love in the face of challenges. And there's just a small way I feel like I experienced this a little while ago where I was just in a season where it was harder to connect with God and he felt more absent and I was feeling, thinking about a season in past where I was more connected and I was kind of almost feeling frustrated and, and upset. Why isn't God close? Like, why isn't there that comfort and that sense? And, but I also had this sense that he had a purpose in it and that he was growing me through it. And, and there was a capacity to trust him more when he's not experienced as intimately and closely. Uh, but I was kind of frustrated about it. But then through this passage in Hebrews, recognized, well, actually, the, the challenge is, is because he wants me to grow because he loves me. It can actually be received as discipline, which is an expression of love. And it just totally reframes how to think about a situation that actually a situation that might be painful where someone might even have the ability to take away the pain, uh, but actually the pain is necessary for the greater purpose and the growth that's required. In a similar way that a surgeon shows that they care for you by cutting you. Like, that's painful. Like, you wouldn't think it's a loving thing to do to cut somebody with a knife. But it is for a surgeon, and for them to not is unloving and uncaring. To say, I don't want to make you hurt. Like, I don't want you to bleed, so I'm not going to cut you. It's like, that would be uncaring and negligent. The, the thing the surgeon has to do is cause pain in order to heal. And uh, again, it's not necessarily that God is causing it, but he's allowing things that actually may be difficult, that may be painful, that may be challenging, that we might rather he just get rid of. But it's that his goal is not to make us comfortable and feel good all the time. His goal is to make us holy and to grow in a character to be more and more like him. So again, let's just just pause on that truth, that he cares for us, but sometimes his care is actually expressed by allowing us to go through and have to endure through challenges and difficulty. So we can thank God for his discipline, even when it's difficult. You might like to pray about how he might be growing you through a current challenge you are facing.
So God, God is compassionate and He's a Father, and but we might sometimes think that when He's not doing what we want or fixing or changing things straight away, that that's uh, shows He's not compassionate or doesn't care. But actually, that might actually be revealing that He does care. He just doesn't care necessarily about the thing in the same way we do. He cares enough for us to to not answer some prayers that actually wouldn't be good for us in in um, the end or in terms of what He knows is the path to life. Um, and as well, I think sometimes, um, like, w- w- we, like, we know that He's compassionate, but actually His compassion is so much larger than ours that His compassion actually might cause problems for us or actually cause challenges in our life. And this is really what we see uh, in the story of Jonah. Um, uh, and uh, you, you probably know some of the basic story or some like the kids' version of the Jonah story. is It's about a prophet who runs away from God's call to go and preach against an evil empire. The Assyrians are like the superpower of the day, a, a evil people, violent, terrible enemy of Israel. And God says to go and speak against them because of their wickedness and their evil. And Jonah goes literally the opposite direction as far as he possibly can and runs away, which is already straight away a dumb thing to do for a prophet who knows God is everywhere and you can't run away from God. And, and he runs and he uh, ends up in a storm, which again is a form of God's discipline. God is stopping him from running away from God because that's a bad idea. Like, and, and he's confronting him through the storm. Uh, but his response is to like, tell the sailors to throw him overboard. He'd rather die than, than turn around and go back and, and do this thing that God's calling him to do, but he he goes down in the in the water, and God's mercy sends a fish who, who swallows him. And in this, he he goes through a change of heart, where he prays and he he repents and he's humbled, and then he's ready to go and obey. And he goes to the city and preaches, but his obedience is pretty half-hearted. It, it's a very basic message he pr- preaches. The city's going to be overthrown in forty days. It's got barely any words. It's not that he really is carrying God's heart for the city. He's just now he's uh, obeying, um, at least ex- externally. Uh, he doesn't try very hard, but his message is incredibly effective. Uh, the king humbles himself. The animals humble themselves. Everyone does. It's, and it's kind of meant to have this kind of comedic feel to it, the book. And, and, but, but the whole city uh, is converted. And there's even this sort of play on words because Jonah says that the city will be overturned in the sense he means it'll be destroyed. But the city is overturned, but it's because they, they turn around. They repent and they turn to God. And they're, they're, God has mercy on them and because God is compassionate. And this is what makes Jonah so mad. It makes him incredibly angry. We'll read again just chapter 4. And again, most of the kids' books don't have chapter 4. Like Most people don't read chapter 4, but it's profound. Uh, but to, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, that God had mercy on them, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. People often think that Jonah runs away because he's scared of the superpower evil enemy. It's not because he's scared. It's because, this is what he says, it's because I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He says, I knew that you were going to forgive them, God, and I could not stand that, and I would not be a part of it. So he runs away. And then the fish forces him to do it, he does it, he kind of feels forced into it. He's upset of how it works out. So now he's suicidal again. He says, now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. He would rather die now because his enemies have been forgiven. This is, this is what the book is presenting is this prophet is like. God, God then confronts him with a plant, uh, and he grows, God grows this plant up above him, that gives him shade and makes him really happy and everything's great because the plant's there. And then God sends a worm that eats the plant and then Jonah just loses it again. And he's just so angry that the plant is gone. Now he's outside the city, he's in the sun and he's just incredibly angry. And then God confronts him and this is how the book finishes. It says, but the, 
The Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should not I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? And that's how the book ends. It's like God cares for these people who are lost. And he cares for their animals. <laughs> like, is his compassion is what God is, is like. And the, the idea of the book finishing like this is it's actually meant to confront us. Because the book is, is like, it's a picture of Jonah is actually not a good person <laughs> to follow. But he's a picture of God's people. And it's meant to confront us with the vastness of his compassion. It's that he cares more than we realize and in ways that may actually challenge us because he cares for all people, even for our enemies. And this is supposed to confront us because in the story, Jonah is, you would think, the good guy. He's the Israelite. He's the prophet. He's the religious person. Like he's where we would sit, right? He's the person in church. Like, but in the story, he's a really bad guy. He's not a nice guy. Like, he's not the, he's a guy that runs away from God, who'd rather die than see his enemies forgiven, who's angry at the compassion and mercy of God. But the bad guys in the story are the sailors who are pagans, who, when, when the storm is still, they basically are saved. Like, they, they repent, and they turn to God, and honor God. And then the Assyrian Nilevite Empire, like these evil people, repent and humble themselves and respond to God. So the, the prophet is running away from God and angry at God. And the people that you would expect to be rejecting God are the ones responding to him and responding to his compassion. And it's supposed to challenge us and make us uncomfortable by the idea that God's compassion might actually be greater than we expect and might actually challenge us because maybe we've reduced it to a, a form that's actually comfortable but actually suits us, whereas God's care is way bigger. Another example of this is God's compassion causing problems is in um, the story of Jesus' disciples when they have thousands of people and they need food and Jesus' disciples say, like, just send them home. Like, they need to go get their own food. And Jesus says, no, I have compassion on the crowd. You feed them. And it creates this crisis for the disciples. Jesus cares about these people and now they have a problem. And if Jesus just didn't care that much, they could just go home. But it's like, no, he's compassionate. He wants to feed them. And so they need to find a way. And, and, and they, Jesus obviously miraculously provides. And God may want us to serve and help people in a way that's actually a challenge to us, that actually makes us uncomfortable because his compassion is more than we may think or may expect. So again, let's pause on that point. And we can celebrate that and thank God for the vastness of his compassion for all, but also just consider any ways the greatness of his compassion, even for your enemies, may be confronting or make you uncomfortable.
So God cares so greatly and maybe more than we expect. And his care for us is often for the purpose of actually making us more like him in his care and his compassion, because that is what he knows is the best thing for us, because humans are designed to be reflections of God. And if God is the father of compassion, he wants us as his children to, to reflect him and to grow. And, and Jesus highlights this um, with this point, like, right, Jonah is about the confrontation that God loves Jonah's enemies, and he can't accept that. And he, he loves people that he thinks God shouldn't love. Um, but Jesus confronts us that the, one of the main ways to reflect God's love is by loving your enemies, is by loving everybody, not just people who love us. Jesus said it this way, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect. The God's is perfect in that His love is perfect. It's He loves everybody. He loves and shows compassion to His enemies. And um, the call is for us. What it looks like and means to be His children is to grow in reflecting that as well. That He is a Father full of compassion who cares for the whole world. So as His children, He is growing us to reflect that same care and compassion to all, even in ways that may cost us, as it cost him. Because this compassion for the world obviously cost him greatly. It led to the cross. Jesus goes to the cross. Jonah would rather die than see his enemies saved. He, um, he attempted suicide in a sense. He jumped off the, 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 he said, just kill me, throw me off the sea, right? And then after it happens, he says, I'd rather die than have this happen. But G Jesus, though, love for his enemies was demonstrated in that he would die for them so that they would be saved. And we are included in that. And the call is for us to follow Jesus in the way of the cross, which is the way of actually, is actually sacrificial love in loving others, not because they deserve it, not because they love us, um, but because God loves us. And because God loves them. And because this is what it means to be his children, is to reflect his love to all, because he is the father of all. He's compassionate and gracious to all. And that's incredibly hard. And we fail at that massively. I'm not good at that at all. And the sad thing is, it's incredibly hard to love the people who do love you. Like, we're often not even good at that, <laughs> or let alone loving the people that don't love us and they're against us. But this is what it looks like to be in relationship with God, to be on this journey of growing, to be like that. We fail at this massively, but there's, there's an encouragement in the story of Jonah because he's an absolute failure in the sense of how he responds to God and carries God's heart and has love. But he, he's so successful in that God uses him to save a bunch of people. Like, like the sailors are saved. And then the Ninevites are saved. Like despite God, Jonah's weakness, God uses him and works through him. And despite our weakness, God can use us still and work through us, even though we fail and fall short. But the amazing thing is Jesus didn't fail. Jesus was perfect in his obedience, in carrying the Father's heart. He went to the cross. And because of that, his grace covers our failures. He forgives us for where we fall short. And he works through us more despite us and our weakness. His, he's the one who perfectly reflects the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's a reflection of the heart of God. And we're called to follow him and grow as reflections as well. So let's come to communion and we're going to respond today. And I think we can come and just acknowledge how far we fall short. Um, but we can celebrate just the greatness of God's compassion to us 
in our failures and sins, but also recognize his compassion to the world and that he wants to use us to reflect his love to the world. Um, so we did it last week, but I think we could do it again. Let's, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, and then as you're ready, please come, and if you're a follower of Jesus, come and respond with communion and um, take the bread and the cup and, and yeah, we'll just dwell on his love expressed through the cross. So if you could stand, um, if you're able, and then let's, um, let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thus says. 